Chapter 2 At dawn, the wind no longer blew from Hawk's Peak. It blew from all three of the towering peaks down upon our village. No fires burned outside that morning because of the wind. I went through the great lodge and divided the cow's roots we had gathered. I told my father about the white people who were living in a cabin on one of the creeks that fed Wallawa River, how they were digging gold. I said nothing about the hole I had shot in the woman's copper pan. They are the first, but more are on the way, he said. He often talked to me, for he had no sons. Unlike other girls in our village, I often talked back. We will stop them. Here we stand, I said. I felt angry when I thought of white people cutting the trees and planting wheat where our horses and cattle roamed. No, daughter. We are few, and they are many. They're locusts, and they'll devour us. Not if we stand and fight. If we fight, they will devour us all the quicker. My father turned his back, which meant that he would not listen to another word. His mind was made up. I do not like this wind, he said. It sounds like many horses running. Joseph, my father, son of old Joseph, was an honored chieftain of the Namipu. He was their chieftain because he could see far away into the land of the suns and moons that had not yet risen, at the snowflakes before they fell, the small green worm deep in the ruddy apple, the thought before it is spoken. He was a kind, gentle man. For me, too kind with the whites. He was not a warrior. On the backs of the running horses are soldiers, he said. Their leader is Howard. The man who has only one arm? I asked. My father nodded. We were standing among some trees on the shore of Wallawa Lake. Waves piled up on the shore. Stout trees thrashed and bent. The mats around the bottom of the lodge flapped like birds ready to fly away. My father stood tall and broad-shouldered. He had black hair that he wore in two long braids tied with ribbons. He used to play games with me, but not any more. Not since the white men had come to root gold from our hills and streams, and I had stood with those who would fight. Why does the white leader return? I asked. You answered him once. You spoke plain words to him. He returns because he does not believe what I told him. Now you'll tell him again? This time he rides with soldiers. But still you will tell him. My father did not answer. His silence made me afraid that at last, at last he would weaken and give in to the soldiers. A single horse ran swiftly toward us. On its back was Tuhulhulsot, an honored priest of the Dreamers and leader of the Rovers from the Seven Devils country. He was in Wallawa to speak with my father about the soldiers. They come, he called. The one-armed general leads them. I know, my father said. I hear their horses. The sun was dying as we stood beside the lake. In the last of its light, a band of soldiers rode out of the woods. They came fast through our village. Out in front rode General Howard, the man who had one arm and wore silver stars on his jacket. He pulled up in front of us, and a soldier came out and stood beside my father to help the two men talk together. As I rode through your village, the general said, I looked but saw not one sign that you plan to heed my order and move your people from Wallawa. My father answered him in a gentle voice. We have decided not to move to Lapwe, this other place. It is small and far away. It has little grass to feed our many horses. You have a thousand horses, Chief Joseph, General Howard said. You have thousands of horses. You have more horses than you can ever use or sell. My father said, I have been to Lapway to look. There are Indians living in Lapway already. I saw three lodges and many teepees. I will move them, the one-armed general said. Everyone will be moved and there will be much room in Lapway. That is not good to drive people from their homes, my father said. A furious gust of wind bore down upon us. The general's beard blew straight out. The two men stood and stared at each other. In a tangle of trees behind them, three men, 
two of them in red jackets, were watching. They had ridden up silently. I knew all of them. The redcoats were warriors who had sworn to fight General Howard and his soldiers to the death. Their leader was Walitiz. He hated the whites because his father was murdered by a white man, who had never been punished for the crime. Red Moccasin Tops, his cousin, hated the whites for the same reason. They lived for the day they would take revenge. They wore their red jackets as a warning sign to the whites of the revenge that would come. To one side, among the trees, stood a tall young man, his hair piled on top of his head and a leather band painted with flying birds tied tightly around his forehead. Swan Necklace was cousin to both redcoats, but was there, I knew, only to guard their horses. He didn't hate the soldiers or the white settlers or anyone else, not even his own father who called him an idler and sometimes knocked him down with a sharp cuff on the ear. He would get to his feet again, brush the dirt from his jacket, and smile. The last time his father, old Two Moons, gave him a thrashing, I was watching. It was three suns ago, early in the morning. Swan Necklace had been away all night in the mountains. He went to the mountains to gather baskets of earth, all colors of earth, yellows and reds and blues. He mixed the colors with something that looked like water, but was really a secret of his own, and painted pictures of the sun and moon, of birds and deer and buffalo. He painted the pictures on dresses and jackets, on mats and skins if the owners wanted them. The paint never rubbed off or faded. As soon as Swan Necklace slid off his horse the morning he came back from the mountains, his father grabbed the baskets of earth and scattered them on the ground. Listen, idler of all the hills and valleys and meadows in this realm of the living, he said. Listen to me. His son listened and smiled a little, but more to himself than to two moons. Death stalks the land of the wandering waters, his father said. We are surrounded by soldiers who are here to drive us from our homes or to kill us. Our young warriors, you know them all, many are your relatives, have armed themselves and stand ready to face the soldiers, to die, and here you come riding in from the mountains with dirt to paint pictures. He gave Swan Necklace a shove that sent him sprawling. He stood over him and said, I gave Red Moccasin Tops and Walitids the blankets from which they made their red jackets. Now I give them my son to take care of the horses. I have spoken to them. They will accept you as a horse holder. Go now to talk about horses. Swan Necklace got to his feet, but he hung back and did not leave us. His father said, You have no choice. Go, or I'll banish you from the clan. You will be a wanderer for the rest of your life, no longer a Nimipu. Swan Necklace glanced at me. We had grown up together. I had loved him for a long time, for as many moons as there are stars. I put a hand over my heart and gave him the secret sign of love. Without a word, he went off to talk to the Redcoats. <laughs>